welcome you to our class on the prison epistles. As we begin this morning, Brother Billy Mormon is going to lead us in number 957. Number 957. This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Just up in glory land we'll live eternally. The saints on every hand are shouting victory. Their song of sweetest praise drifts back from heaven's shore. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, one Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. You are visiting with us this morning. You are our honored guest. We're certainly glad to have you here. got the preacher mic. I've got an on button. Can you hear from this one? All right, we'll just have to use this one, I guess. Test, test, one, two, three, four. Brother Behrman, is it coming through okay now? Is it coming through okay? We'll just use that one. Test, test. Okay, that will work better.
Somebody wants me to be right here, I think, this morning. Sister Maydean Crow will have a procedure done on her back on Wednesday. Uh, as a result of a fall last week, we want to keep Sister Maydean in our prayers. Um, Brother Joel Cupper continues in the hospital in Tupelo. It's really good to have Michelle Holcomb back uh, in the auditorium this morning following surgery. Uh, Stanley Williams, that's Leanne Grisham's father, is in the Magnolia Hospital. Uh, Dorothy Hester is in the uh, Tupelo Hospital. She had a blood clot in her lung, is being treated there. Are there others that we need to be uh, remembering in prayer? Uh, there is a memorial service for Keita Stevens this afternoon at the North Ryanzi uh, congregation. Visitation starts at 2. The memorial service itself starts at 3. Brother J.T. Beard and uh, Brother Scott Floyd leave tomorrow for a mission trip to Guyana. We need to be remembering them in our prayers. And remember, next Sunday will be our big day with Mike Eaton. Uh, Mike will be teaching this auditorium class next Sunday. Would you uh, bow with me, please? Our loving Heavenly Father, in whom we live and move and have our very being, we're so thankful, Father, that we can assemble this morning to study your word, and we pray that your blessings would be upon this class. And Father, we pray your special care to be with Sister Maydean Crow and the procedure she's going to undergo this week. We pray your special care to continue with uh, Joel Cupper and June Cupper, Paula Warner, and all those suffering uh, from cancer and undergoing treatment. Uh, we are we, including uh, Stanley Williams. Uh, Father, we uh, ask that we're thankful for uh, Michelle Holcomb's good recovery, and we pray that you would continue to bless her, and, and we ask that you be with Dorothy Hester in her treatment at the uh, hospital in Tupelo. And, and we pray for your comfort on the uh, family of Keita Stevens. We love you, Father. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Test, 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 test. Uh huh. Third time's a charm. You look at the part of the outline that we're in starting today we're in a call to walk in purity beginning in verse 17 uh, of chapter 4 and continuing through verse 21 of chapter 5 and what we're going to find is that Paul will be talking about walk not as other Gentiles walk in love walk as children of light and walk as wise as we continue on we'll be uh, covering a, a call to walk in harmony. That'll probably be in two weeks. So let's begin with verse 17. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanness with greediness, but you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. 
that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Now, <clears throat> what did the Gentiles do because they were past feeling? Anybody get an answer to that? Well, when I looked at it, they had given themselves over to lewdness, to work all uncleanness with greediness. It sounds very similar to what Paul wrote when he wrote to the church in Rome about how people rejected all the evidence that was before him about God. And it's just uh, when people reject God, the path that they go on is sometimes towards lewdness, towards things that are unclean, and they become very self-centered or greedy. What did Paul tell the congregation that they should not do? Walk as the other Gentiles walked. Now this congregation had... Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles, and so he's gone into a pagan area, and he's converted people to Christianity, and some of the people that he is writing to in Ephesus were people who had come out of the pagan way of life, and he's telling them not to walk as the other Gentiles walk. You can see that there in verse 17. What did Paul tell this congregation that they should do. Well, if you look at verse 24, uh, he told them that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. When you think about what Paul wrote uh, in Romans, the sixth chapter, where he talked about when, when a person is baptized, they die to sin, and they're raised to walk in newness of life. Many times when Paul is, is writing, he, he gives a contrast between the dark side and, the, uh, a, and light. I know I saw a picture yesterday of some people dressed up in Star Wars costumes. You know, even Star Wars talks about the dark side. Well, when Paul's talking about the dark side, it's, it's not make-believe. It's real, and it's the devil's side. Let's look at uh, verses 25 to 32. Therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ forgave you. Well, rather than lie, what should Christians do? Speak the truth to one another. Um, who's the father of all lies? And when you think about truth, who do you think of? God or Christ? You know, it, it's two ends of the spectrum, and, and Christians should not lie. Therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. 
you think about how our body works. We are members of one another. And we don't want to have one part of our body fighting with another part of our body. We ought to work in harmony together so that the body functions well. And when we speak the truth to one another, that's the lubricant that just keeps things working correctly. What was Paul's warning about anger and wrath? All right. Be angry and do not sin. Is it possible to be angry and not sin? Absolutely. Uh, well, just think about Jesus when he walked into the temple and saw the money changers there and caught the tables and flipped the, ta and flipped the tables over. He was emotionally intense at that point in time. But what happens when you get angry? What, what, why do you think Paul gave this warning here about why did he give this watch out about getting angry? Sister Williams said that we tend to lose control when we get angry. Uh, it, it is very easy. Now, if you get angry, what is the first thing that usually you lose control of? Oh, yeah, the tongue, the mouth. You know, you, you'll just say, you might say things that you regret. It's sort of hard to get those words back once they come out. And so this is a good caution that, that Paul is giving to the congregation here about now, what, what it also says is that we are capable of controlling what? Our emotions. God would not give us a command that was impossible to carry out. And I, I'm not a professional counselor, but I would think that counselors have to deal with people on helping them understand that they are in charge of their emotions. You know, sometimes when people are stimulated there's an immediate response. And if you can ever get response to be separated from stimulus by time enough to think, sometimes the reaction is different. You count to ten before you react. Think before you react. And, and Christians, a, a growth process for Christians is to be able to consciously decide how we're going to act when we don't when we're stimulated by something in our environment he said be angry and do not sin do not let the sun go down on your wrath now when he said don't let the sun go down on your wrath what is he telling us Not to go to bed mad at somebody, okay. Well, tell me what's behind that. What, what is implied when it says, don't let the sun go down on your wrath? Take care of the matter now. Don't, don't just let it hang on and hang on and hang on. You know, Jesus was talking about, if you, uh, you go to the temple and uh, somebody has got something against you, what are you supposed to do? Leave. Stop. Turn around. It's not time for you to go to worship. It's time for you to go and work out that problem with the person that you've got the problem with. And, and that's a good analogy, that, that medical analogy. The best time to take care of an infection is when it starts. If we let it fester... Sometimes you have to amputate. And if you just delay, if you delay solving the problem, what you're doing is you're playing into the devil being in control of the situation. 
What advice did Paul give about the proper way to get money? Work. Work. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good. Now, why, why does he need money? That he may have something to give him who has need. What advice did Paul give about the way we should talk? I don't know if you picked up on that, but there in verse 29, he said, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearer. This is one that many of us, me included, uh, have to sort of challenge ourselves on. That think about how your speech is going to come across. Uh, it, it is very easy to say things in a um, in a harsh manner that that might offend somebody when when you didn't have the intent of doing that. So try, try to think through, how are my words going to impact this other person? Because we have a lot of control on how we say things. And I think here, certainly we don't want to have corrupt speech, but also we want to have our speech seasoned with salt. How do you think a person could grieve the Holy Spirit because he talked about here about not grieving the Holy Spirit. How could we grieve the Holy Spirit? When you sin and don't turn from it, or sin. I heard two answers there, both of which sound very appropriate. The Holy Spirit is a guest within us. And when sin enters our mind or body, He's going to feel unwelcome. It will, it will grieve him. What should we then, therefore, put away? Uh, Janita just listed a whole bunch of those things there. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Evidently, how people talk to one another was a problem in Ephesus. How people talk to one another in Boonville, Mississippi is also a potential problem. And if we could just take Paul's advice to put away all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking with all malice, If you're going to preach a sermon to uh, today's politicians, what would be a good text to use? You can probably come up with several. What did Paul tell the Ephesians to do in verse 32? Say that again. Well, you, that was a good answer for the other one. Be, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ forgave you. Now, that's what Sister Sue said we ought to be preaching to politicians. I think that would be a good one to preach to politicians as well. Now then, let's move on to chapter 5. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us, and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, 
nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore do not be partakers with them. As we are imitators of God, we will walk in what? We'll walk in love as Christ did. List the things that should, be not, that should not be named with us. What were some of those things? Fornication, uncleanness, covetousness, filthiness, Let's just take a look at these. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetous, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints. And then you have to go on to verse 4, but it's a continuation there. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. Now what would... Evidently, sexual sin was extremely prevalent in this pagan society because in the list of no-nos that Paul gives, he, he many times starts out with sexual sins. And, and their sexual sins were both physical as well as verbal. You know, he gets down here and talks about this coarse jesting or or uh, filthiness. If you wanted to think about us today in, in our environment, uh, we have the opportunity to get involved in these kinds of things. It, pornography is very prevalent. The internet uh, is overflowing with opportunities for people to corrupt their mind as is television. Kaufman said, this is another of Paul's catalogs of vice. None of them, not even all of them together, being any complete list of sins, but merely typical. And, and he lists several places where Paul has other lists of sins. I think it's important to know that as uh, Burton Kaufman is saying here, that when there's a list of sins, this is, this is a representative list. It's not meant that this is all the sins there are. But if you uh, look at it, fornication is prominently mentioned in practically all of these due to its uh, prominence in the pagan culture from which Gentile converts to Christianity had been recruited. Now, I've gone back and I've tried to list out the no-nos from some of Paul's other list. Now, I'm going to read through these, and I want you to just look for commonalities or, or overlapping items in his list. In Ephesians, the fifth chapter, he lists fornication, uncleanness, covetousness, filthiness, foolish talking, and coarse jesting, and that's what we just looked at. But if you go to Romans, the first chapter, verses 29 to 32, he lists being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, and in the last verse of uh, Romans, the first chapter, he goes into great detail to let us know that if we are tolerant of sin, that we're sinful ourselves. So it's not just the ones that do that, but it's the ones that put up with people that do that. Then in uh, 1 Corinthians 5, verse 11, But now I have written to you to, not to keep company with anyone named a brother who is... So this is a special list. This is a list of those things that 
members of the church do, that we should not to have company with them if they do this, if they're sexually immoral, covetous, an idolater, a reviler, a drunkard, an extortioner. Then in Galatians, the fifth chapter, you're fami very familiar, I'm sure, with this because this is where he lists works of the flesh. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambition, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries. Then in Colossians that we studied in chapter 3, verses 5 through 9, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth, and do not lie to one another. All right, when you, uh, this is a bonus question, it's not what you've already looked at, but when you look at Paul's multiple list of no-nos for Christians, what conclusions do you draw? Sister Martin said it looks like it'd be hard to have fellowship with about 90% of the people in the world. What conclusions do you draw from his list of sins, though? That's, re that's really the essence of my question. What jumps out at you? Well, don't do it, but what is it? What kind of sins, if you wanted to group these sins, what kind of sins are, jump out at you at, that he's concerned about? Sin, sins of the flesh. He, he, there's just a whole lot of sins that are sexually oriented in his list. Uh, what jumped out at me, too, was that there are a bunch of sins that are sins of the tongue. What, how we say and how we deal with each other. There... There was also a bunch of sins of the mind. The, our whole attitude about how we're dealing with other people. Uh, when I was going through that list, I, I, this is some of the observations that I made for myself. Avoid sexual sins. Keep God as your number one priority. When he talked about covetousness there, I think about you cannot serve God and mammon. Also, he was talking to a group of people that were very, had come out of idolatry. And, and, and covetousness is equated with idolatry. So don't put anything in your priority list ahead of God. Uh, control your emotions, you know, several things about anger and jealousy. Control your tongue, control your thoughts. Do not be selfish. And he lists drunkenness there. I don't think they had big problems at that time with uh, cocaine and heroin. But they did have problems with alcohol. And he did not treat, well, he said he listed drunkenness as a sin in multiple places. And what that tells me is that it is a sin that can be avoided. Just like staying away from drugs and alcohol can be avoided today. What should we have a reputation for doing? We ought to have a reputation for doing good. Or giving thanks. You know, our purpose is to do good, but here he, he specifically talked about being a thankful people. Who will not get an inheritance from God? Fornicator, the unclean person, and a covetous man. 
he the word of God says that some people are going to be lost. As a matter of fact, Jesus said that most people are going to be lost. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. He doesn't want any of us to be lost, and because he doesn't want any of us to be lost, he has seen forth to give us a Bible to, to let us know where some of the stumbling blocks are, and so we can avoid those. For this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous person who has, is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Can't be much more specific than that. What are the empty words? He used this term, empty words. What are the empty words that Paul warns the Ephesians not to be deceived by? What do you think he was talking about there when he talked about empty words? Flattery, lies, and foolishness up here. Anybody else want to add to that? Say that again. Vain words. What is empty words? That's the whole question here. What is the empty words that we're talking about? Promises that can't be kept. Right? The Ephesians were not to allow anyone to deceive them into thinking that immoral conduct should be indulged in or tolerated. This is the context that he's talking about here. And, and uh, such manipulation may be done by vain words coming from the hearts of those who ignored the coming wrath of God upon the sons of disobedience. When I think about today and empty words, and let's just stay with his sexual sins and homosexuality, just, and we see in the news periodically that one religious group after another has tried to compromise the Bible teaching on homosexuality and, and they'll have a preacher or a priest who is, uh, has a homosexual lifestyle that they'll allow to put, fill the pulpit. That, I would call that empty words because that's so contrary. Anything that's contrary to the Bible is empty. It has no value. You can think of probably other agendas. The, the abortion agenda uh, is the empty words. And we see that pushed periodically and regularly. All right, let's move on to Ephesians 5, 8 through 14. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the world. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth finding out what is acceptable to the Lord, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darknesses, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light, for whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore, he says, Awake, you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. What are the three characteristics of the fruit of the Spirit? Tell me one of them. And the other? And the other? Goodness, righteousness, and truth. The, Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. What did Paul tell the Ephesian Christians to do with the unfruitful works of darkness? Have no fellowship with them. 
Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. The American Standard Version says, but rather even reprove them. How do Paul's instructions to the Ephesians apply to us today? I hear one word answer up here, it said the same. The unfruitful work of darkness are all around us. And I think we need to show a clear contrast between the world and ourselves. People in Boonville need to understand where we stand in our beliefs, and they need to see by our behavior where we stand, and they need to see that it's different from the world. might be able to get through verse 21. Uh, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore do not be unwise, but understand that the will, what the will of the Lord is, and do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. What does it mean to redeem the time? Make good use of the time. When you think about these people, the the use of the time as to rescue the time as far as possible, the time already lost to the days of darkness when you lived in sin. You may have known people that became Christians later in life, and then they wanted to do all that they could to serve the Lord with the little bit of time that they had left. What they're doing is redeeming the time. Make a wise and sacred use of every opportunity for doing good so that zeal and well-doing are, as it were, the purchase money by which we make the time our own. What does Paul say about using alcohol to stimulate or for excitement? Don't do it. Do not be drunk with wine. He calls it dissipation or self-indulgence. When we are filled with the Spirit, what are some of the things we do? For the sake of time, let me just give you my answer. Filled implies all the available space is utilized. We are filled with the product of the Spirit, God's Word. Our thoughts and behavior is consistent with the fruit of the Spirit. None of the works of the flesh will be evident in our lives. We at uh, beginning in verse 9 start transitioning into some talk about instrumental music. Uh, That is a good break point for us and so we will begin with verse 19 and the whole concept of instrumental music in worship in two weeks. Remember Brother uh, Mike Eaton will be here to teach our class next week. Thank you for your help.